Hello. Good to, good to be here in Boston and, 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 and be able to talk to you about the maker movement. I have to say I'm a little bit... Uh, feel out of context. I think of Singularity University and these conferences as, as thinking big. And I, and I think that where I've gotten to is actually the art of thinking small. Um, uh, I look at what individuals are doing, what enthusiasts are doing, and I, I kind of trust that. And I follow and look for patterns and uh, to try to understand how what they're doing, often for non-commercial reasons, leads to something that's more important. I'm going to talk to you about the maker movement, but in a, in a, a week from Friday, we open um, Maker Fair in the Bay Area. I don't know if you've been to a Maker Fair, but I, I hope you can check one out. Uh, but this is sort of an example of I didn't really know when I started this about 11 years ago how many people out there are makers. Uh, but I had met some number of them, and I thought they were compelling people with interesting uh, projects that they were doing and they would like to share their projects with uh, each other and perhaps the public would find it interesting. It has grown to be, um, uh, the event in, in the Bay Area will be about 150,000 people over two days. We'll have several thousand makers, uh, we'll have companies, we have uh, schools, we have all kinds of people coming together. You know, if you imagine sort of one way to flip Maker Fair into this audience would be what if you brought your family to an event? about technology, about the future? What if you could your, uh, bring your kids to an event and they would enjoy it as much as you did? That's what I was trying to create with Maker Fair, to provide not a geek festival with a few guys there geeking out, but really something that uh, can be broad and uh, experienced by many people, many who are not necessarily comfortable with technology or science. And I think my message all along, I, I think, has, has been, I, I want more people to see themselves as makers, not just consumers. To consider themselves to be creative, productive people. And that that is something that's important to them. Now, I, I can't necessarily take credit for where this has gone, but I do think I initiated something which seems to resonate with people. And it, it's almost that my belief is this was once time a mainstream idea in our culture, and it had moved out to the fringe. And I'm trying to bring it back to be something that's part of our cultural identity, something that's part of our economic identity, to make things and create things. And that's why I, I think the, the thing that I've tried the most to do is to expand the notion of who gets to participate in this maker movement, that I really want everybody, every child, every adult, to, be, to see themselves as a maker. I don't necessarily care whether they're doing electronics. They might be a cook, a gardener. They might do woodworking. But we have this opportunity to integrate lots of different skill sets, lots of different mindsets into this maker movement. I see it as a as a participatory sport, as something that, it's something you do, you don't watch. And if you're at Maker Faire, you get to interact with makers, you get to learn from them, you get to make something yourself. This is a photo of, of the Boston Marathon taking off. And I've always thought, uh, you know, a few years ago I was thinking about, what else looks like a movement that sort of has similar parallels to the maker movement? And I came up with marathoning. You know, there are more marathoners today than ever. And mostly they run for personal reasons. They're amateurs. They do it because it means something to them. And I think that's where I start with the maker movement. It's, it's something for, for wonderfully great reasons people believe is valuable to them personally. And it turns out when you start connecting that together, you create a community of makers and that community begins to collaborate. And, and that's the, the two words I'd like to make sure I stick in your brain. It's not about technology like 3D printers, and it's, it's not about necessarily Maker Faire or Maker Spaces, but really the sense of a maker community, and it's a community that collaborates, um, in, in, I think informally, in new ways. I, I'm just gonna present it briefly, but I, I've kind of thought of the maker 
uh, uh, community is segmented in, in three ways. You know, it's, it's sort of the people that come to Maker Fair as attendees, often they're what I call zero to Maker. They would like to become makers, but they don't have the skills yet to do much, and, but they're interested. They want to be in there. Um, maker to Maker is the community itself. Once you have a project, you become a maker. You get to talk about what you're doing, what you're working on. And then finally, Maker to Market, which is relatively speaking, uh, 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 just uh, you know, 12 to 15, maybe 20% of, uh, of makers who really want to, either they work professionally in this or they want to bring a product to market and say they use Kickstarter and various methods to do that. But what's driving, I think, the, the maker movement is cheap technology, accessible technology. Um, this is a, a, a cover earlier in the year for us on, you know, look at these computer, these Raspberry Pi board for $5, a $9 board, and, and a $3 board. Um, it, it is dramatically changing, the, you know, not only the form factor, but, but also sort of the price point of what you can do. And invites people to treat, you know, the, these microcontrollers as almost disposable items, that they could put them in a project, and if the project blows up, well, it was only a $3 board. So they are willing and able to try new things. And, and so there's just a proliferation of, of these components, whether you find them online, through a DigiKey or a McMaster car, or in places like Shenzhen and, and in Tokyo and Akihabara, where they have all kinds of components. Um, the other thing, you know, while I talk about in many ways the democratization of technology around some things like Arduino or 3D printing, it's also about the democratization of learning. That means that if, if, if it's easier to get access to the tools of production, it's also easier to learn how to use them. And one of the drivers for that learning, one of the on-ramps, I believe, for, that, for the maker movement is, are called maker spaces. I was at MIT yesterday. They have over 40 maker spaces on campus. This is uh, in the mechanical engineering building, and that's Lucy, who's a, a BattleBots contestant, uh, but she works in this maker space here. And it's giving students uh, the ability to create and make uh, even on their own. Now, some of those spaces at MIT you could use if you were doing research or in a class. These kind of maker spaces, though, you could use for any reason and they're typically busy at night, and sometimes late at night. This is another one off campus. This is a student-operated uh, makerspace called Miters, and uh, it looks like a dorm room on steroids, I guess. Uh, uh, but um, you know, one of the students told me when he was a, uh, in high school, he began finding projects online that were created by students at Miters, and he wanted to go to MIT because he wanted to access to this space. So uh, this is a McLuhan quote, but as we begin to use these tools and have access to them, it changes us. It changes how we think, and it changes what we, we think we can do. And I, I believe, particularly in this frame here of, of manufacturing, um, I, I will say, I, I regard making, a, a, particularly the maker movement, as more of a prototyping revolution than a manufacturing revolution. It's easier to take your idea and instantiate it into a prototype today. Actually getting to full production is still, there's still kind of the obstacles there, uh, uh, partly because the manufacturing industry isn't helping us a whole lot in small batch manufacturing. But, uh, but nonetheless, it's changing the idea of how we make things, where we make things, you know, who gets to make things, and, and actually what we end up making. Now Deming, uh, you probably know, he, you know, he said this many, many years ago, innovation comes from the producer, not the customer. And I think that's how traditional businesses still think. They don't think of their customer as an innovator, as a participant, or at least a partner in the creation and production of things. Um, and, and I think you know, what we are doing in some ways, what happens when you see your customer as the producer? Uh, and to some degree, you become the facilitator in that. And I would call that sort of collaborative production or co-production. You sometimes hear the terms co-creation and others. But I want to show you some examples that I see emerging. They're probably small, 
from your point of view, maybe insignificant, but I think there are actually signals on, on what's happening and, and what's new out there. Um, before I go forward, though, you know, not too many miles from here, uh, this is an example, uh, a photo from the Lowell Mills. You know, the first, in, first factory, really, a uh, textile factory in, uh, in the U.S. And, and its, its real um, achievement was taking the, all, the, all the things that were done out in the cottage industries, you know, the different skill sets, and bringing them into one unified process. So from beginning to end, from the, you know, the bales of wool arriving to you know, the finished product out at the end. And this is how the industrial economy was organized, you know, really in contrast to the craft economy and things that preceded it. And in many ways, I think when we talk about collaborative production, we're looking at something different than that single factory. And it looks in some ways like a, 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 a hybridization of that and the craft economy. So this is a company out of London called Nitton, and they, um, uh, they are, it's, a, it's a boutique shop where you can go and get, buy knitwear. But what's really fascinating to me is that's an industrial sewing machine, um, a knitting machine in the shop. So what you order is made while you're there. It's like a bakery that has an oven, right? Instead of sending it off to China, it's made right there. And you actually can, using an iPad app, change you know, the design and change what's going on there. Um, and and you, know, you may go shop for 20 minutes, and you come back, and your sweater is made for you, or scarf. Now, this is something I was working on. And it's kind of actually a sort of classic idea around 3D printing is, well, something breaks, and you can repair it or, or make something to replace it. This is an oven knob, kind of a standard issue oven knob. But uh, I had one that cracked, and I, I thought, well, I'm going to see if I can't uh, make it. I don't have great 3D design skills, so I thought my first thing is I'll see if I could scan it. And the scans didn't work because you know, there's sort of a top and a bottom to this, and that's sort of a rotational scanner. Um, I, I got horrible scans off it, and that was not a way forward. So, um, so I went to Thingiverse, and it's a, it's a library of digital uh, objects. And I found lots of actually knobs, and some of them might have worked. But what I found that was really interesting was this customizable knob. And, and I actually think this is really important. So instead of just finding the digital file and downloading it, I, I, this is using a parametric design so that I could put these values in and change that shape. And based on just doing the measurements on the knob I had, I could generate a digital file that was specific to my needs. And so you could think of this like a template. Um, you could think of it just as a, as a recipe to make a knob that's custom. And you know that's what the knob looked like um, when, when I brought it into a 3D uh, editing program. And uh, you know, there, underneath there's a stem and there's all these different things. But uh, this was a, a different way that I think many of us that don't have 3D design skills could, could get something made. And I could imagine a future where we have catalogs of these kind of parts, not just the finished part, but these customizers that allow you to, to get what you need. Now, if I wanted to 3D print something and I didn't have a 3D printer and I uh, didn't necessarily want to use a service, I might look into something called 3D Hubs. And this is their map. Now, 3D Hubs is networking 3D printers around the world so that ideally you could get something 3D printed in your neighborhood. So if you look at kind of where you live, and this is probably a year old map, so it should be updated, but um, you know, uh, there are you know, roughly 77 3D printers available in the network in the New York area. Um, and you know, if you actually go down, here's Madison, Wisconsin. You can actually see who those people are, and it's like a restaurant review. You can know whether they're reliable, what kind of printer they have, what, what materials they're, they're willing to use, and what their turnaround time is. Now imagine that. I mean, it sounds kind of trivial in a way, but basically, it's a network of, of people who have bought 3D printers who are willing to, for a few dollars, print something out for you and perhaps underwrite you know, their own, own cost of, of the 3D printer. But it, it's fascinating to me that these are all addressable on a network. 
these, this is the future, I think, of collaborative production, is that all these resources are accessible to you and you're mixing them up together. It is not one factory full of 3D printers that crank out orders, but it's really a network of 3D printers of different capabilities and, and, and maybe even different business models. Now, one of the more successful forms of collaborative production comes in the area of prosthetics. And uh, uh, we did some, uh, a story on, on uh, uh, there's, there's several different initiatives and groups here, but uh, one of the more uh, well-known in the U.S. is called E-Enable, E-Enable. And it's really a community that collaborates around sharing um, uh, uh, designs around particular 3D uh, for 3D prosthetic hands. And I remember at a Maker Faire, I had a father come up to me and, and, and uh, say hello. And he's with his son. And he said, you know, I knew nothing about 3D printing a couple of years ago. But I read about this, and I wanted to make a, son, a hand for my son. And his, his son, you know, raised a, a 3D printed hand that was red and had some kind of superhero logo on it. And you know, if you know if you have a kid, you're going to have to create different versions of these because the kid changes. And this, uh, it's it's something that's very much in need of, of being customized. And so it really is empowering people to do something completely outside the medical manufacturing, you know, industry. Um, and, and most of them feel blocked by that industry, and they're getting involved. And, you know, the model here, ha you know, they say it looks terrible, and it has wires hanging out of an Arduino and a, a kind of a black plastic hand. But it, it, it's, it's a signal that people can do things themselves. Lisa Marie Wiley is a veteran who lost a leg in, a, in, a, uh, in, in Afghanistan. She came back and didn't like the prosthetic she was, you know, uh, uh, um, given and uh, and felt it was you know it was too big and too awkward. Well, she and a couple others got together and designed and 3D printed their own her own prosthetic. It's it's her own. It's her design. And then last year at Maker Faire we had a fashion show, and uh, it was wonderful to see 3D printed prosthetics as a fashion statement not just as a functional thing. And that's the kind of thing a maker community can do with things, is, is they, they, what they make is really a form of self-expression often. It's, it doesn't just solve a problem. It often is, is a, uh, a sign of who they are. It's a story about what they can do. Uh, Nick Pinkston is, uh, I think, creating a factory of the future in San Francisco. Um, his idea is uh, you don't necessarily have 3D printers or, or things in, in your house in, in, or at work. He wants it to be easy for you to design a part and then have it made. He's trying to actually eliminate the contract engineer, contract manufacturer in the middle. He wants to automate a factory so that, first of all, when you're in your CAD program, you're getting feedback on whether the part you're designing can be manufactured and whether he can manufacture it for you. And then you send it to him, and it's like sending you know, an order to Amazon. He's, you're just sending him a file, but he's able to produce that. And what he's eliminated is a lot of the handwork that involves setting up a part um, so that it can be affordable to make one of something. Another example is Abricate. Uh, it's a relatively new startup in San Francisco. And again, this is a model of matching designers and fabricators, but... Um, uh, 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 Mark Roth, who started this, told me, you know, going into Super Bowl week in San Francisco, an order came in that they needed by Friday 10,000 signs, um, and they needed vinyl cutters to do that, and there was nobody that they knew of that could produce 10,000 signs in, um, in a few days. And what Abricate did was, was slice that into different orders and found that there were several companies in the area that could do 2,000 signs and um, aggregate that together and get the order made. So there's really different ways of doing this. One uh, last one, OpenDesk, is uh, doing furniture. Um, uh, uh, here's a de here are designers, uh, open source designs. Anybody could download this. But they're also connecting you to a network of makers who will fabricate that custom design for you. So in many ways, this is the new IKEA. Um, instead of buying the standard part, you can buy something online and then actually have someone make it for you.
So I'm out of time here, but just briefly, the, the, I think the maker movement is, is helping to shape the future. I think it's, it's extremely important. I've talked a little bit about the, the manufacturing and production changes that we see uh, of really sort of combining digital and physical and the whole idea of opening up manufacturing to more and greater participation uh, by uh, different people. Um, lastly, maker fairs. Uh, I mentioned the one in a week or so. Um, but we ha we'll have over 180 maker fairs around the world this year. A couple weeks ago in Paris, six weeks ago I was in, uh, in Cairo, Egypt, where we had 10,000 people coming um, for the second maker fair there. And it's, it's really interesting to see who's showing up, who wants to make things, and, and what they believe is possible now because uh, both of this community and the way they're collaborating. Um, you'll see Adam Savage at Maker Faire. And you'll also see the Department of Energy. Um, this year we'll have eight of the 10 national labs represented and they want to connect to makers, work with makers, invite makers into the labs. And uh, as Kevin Nolan will be talking about later with GE First Build, I think there's a great opportunity to identify makers within companies and organizations and work with those makers outside of those organizations and really come up with really new innovative ideas. So thank you very much and uh, I look forward to talking to you later on a panel. Okay.